Okay, this is the final review before we just call it a day and do it all by CAD. But you have to realize that learning to visualize and start trusting algebra and trigonometry will be faster. You're going to want CAD for something else. So let's look at what a concurrent force problem is and how you think about it when you've got a number of different cables. And here's what we'll do. I'm going to try to be as good as Sal on this one. You can have any number. I'll call that tension 1, tension 2, tension 3, tension 4, dot, 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 tension sub n. So that you know, and remember that these tensions might have actually been something pushing on that point, but you learned that you are going to transmit it through so that you have a direction for each force defined from, of course, in a right-hand coordinate system. You remember the x, the y, the z coming out of the board, and the positive moment there. You know that you can actually get the directions of each one. These, of course, can be, of course, divided into vectors. They can be written as this, t1, the magnitude of t1 times the unit vector in the direction of t1. The second vector can be written as t2 as the unit times the unit vector in the direction of t2, etc. You know that the x component, x component is equal to t1 times the cosine of the direction of t1 and you know that the y component is equal to t1 times the sine of the theta of t1 and then in all reality you can realize that the unit vector is going to be equal to so lambda sub t1 is going to be equal to the magnitude, I'm sorry, the value, so t1 times the cosine of theta of t1 divided by the magnitude of the vector, which is t1. And you know that, and that's times i, and then you know plus t1, the magnitude of t1 times the sine of theta t1 all divided by the magnitude of the vector which is t1 and then you more or less get in a two-dimensional problem the definition of the unit vector is just basically the components of the unit circle that defines this vector so you can stack this up, think about it many, many different ways, but remember that our preferred way later on for actually doing R cross F is going to be the unit vector of the radial vector cross product with the unit vector of the force vector times the magnitude of the R times the magnitude of the F. And these are all like and similar objects. So let's see if I can use this eraser here and erase some stuff out and think about now how you think about this as opposed to how you just solve it if you're trying to do the one-offs here's what you know if you in fact have on a normal basis three equations and three unknowns that being the sum of the forces in the x equals 0, the sum of the forces in the y equals 0, and the sum of the moments about z, the z-axis equal to 0. In this case, one of those equations doesn't work because they all have a moment about the same spot. 
So here's what you know. You can only have, in fact, two unknowns. And so, in fact, if you have more than two unknowns, then you're going to have some issue here. So what you do realistically is you more or less try to think about this, that the unknowns react to the knowns. The unknowns react to the known. So let's assume here that T sub n, and that of course would be T, the fifth one. I just wanted to show you the n. You could have any number of forces here. And T sub 4 are your unknowns. So what do you need to do? Well, in effect, you write and solve, you sum all the knowns. And you know your unknowns are equal and opposite. You sum all your knowns, and you know your unknowns are equal and opposite. Now, graphically, that looks something like this. You know that T1 is a given and T2 is given. And so you add T2 to T1. And then you, of course, have T3. And in fact, what you now know is you have to get back to zero. And so you know the sum of T1, T4, and T5 have to equal that. Because these all equaled. When you took this one plus this one plus this one, they equaled this way. And so those have to equal this way. And so what you end up guessing is that they look something like this. And so your vectors are there and there. Now. Thinking about it that way will eventually help to punch stuff in a calculator a little bit faster. So what do you do? Well, you know that whatever the value is, you take the value of the knowns, whatever that is, and then you write an equation that says the cosine of T4, I'm sorry, of the theta of T4, so T4 times the cosine of the direction of T4 plus t5 times the cosine of the direction of t5 has to be equal to the opposite of the knowns in the x. That's just one way to do it. And when you have it put in this format, you have the format for the reverse row echelon format of a solution. And so you also know that T5 times the cosine of the direction of T5, I'm sorry, this is times the sine, plus, that's T4, time, plus T5 times the sine of the direction of T5 equals the negative of the knowns in the Y. All right, so let me go ahead and go to a new screen and think about this now a little more holistically, if you would. Go to a new screen that I can actually deal with. All right, so what do you do? Figure out the sum of the known components of all your forces. One, add them up, tip to tail, whatever you do. Two, write out an equation summing I guess it's a pair of equations summing the unknowns. And then three, use Newton's third law. If you think that way, you may never ever have to put more than a free body down to get a solution. 
So I'll give that a try on a number of problems using the calculator, and we'll see how we do. Thanks for listening.